Don't we all want to be creative, innovative, and produce services and products of value for our clients? Okay, but you don't feel creative or you don't consider yourself innovative. Innovation expert, Hall of Fame speaker, Bill Stainton, produced the longest running, highest rated, and most award-winning regional comedy TV show. So let's ask Bill, the expert, how you can be even more creative and innovative. Welcome to the Excellent Executive Coaching Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Katrina Berus, and today we have Bill Stainton. Got it? <laughs> That's it, Stainton, yes. Stainton, so good. And you're a Hall of Fame speaker. You had a fabulous comedy, successful on TV show. So tell us, what did you learn about innovation from producing a comedy TV show? I learned a few things. I produced this comedy TV show for 15 years, and I, I learned a lot about innovation and creativity on two different levels. First, we had to invent a brand new show every week. So we had to learn how to be creative and innovative on demand, whether we felt like it or not. So many people make the mistake of thinking, well, I'll just wait for inspiration to strike. Well, I'll tell you, when your paycheck depends on you being innovative, you can't afford to wait for inspiration to strike. So I learned how to become innovative on demand, how to spark that innovation, whether I felt particularly innovative or creative or not, under deadline. And the second thing I learned, because I was the executive producer of the show, was how to lead a creative team. I had a team of, depending on the year, anywhere from eight to 10, incredibly creative, innovative people. They've gone on to become Oscar nominees and TV stars and all kinds of things like that. So they were incredibly creative. And leadership is tough anyhow, but leading an incredibly creative, innovative team is kind of a special type of leadership. So those are kind of the two areas that I really honed over 15 years. So, okay, t tell us the first part, uh, creativity under deadlines. What did you learn about that? I can imagine that that is super challenging to be creative, funny, on a TV show with the pressure it demands. And, you know, people expect such high standards. So how did you do that? Yeah, that's right. And look, let's be honest, we didn't always hit those high standards. I mean, some shows are better than others. Although we did pretty well. Our batting average was pretty darn good. You don't get to stay on the air for 15 years and be number one for the last 10 of those years without knowing what you're doing. But what I learned from that is that, again, innovation is not this lightning bolt that comes down from above. I think that's such a huge misconception, Katrina, that keeps so many people from even trying to be creative or innovative. They just think, well, that's just not for me. You know, lightning doesn't strike me. We just, you know, I'm not one of the creative types. I'm sure you've heard people say that. I'm just, I'm not innovative. So the first shift is a mindset shift to realize that, yes, you are innovative. You are creative. It's not reserved for the geniuses or the gifted few. We are all the gifted few. So that's the first thing. It's just a mindset shift that innovation is available to all of us. And then part of it is just learning a few tricks of the trade. There are certain things that you can do, certain things you can look for, certain elements of innovation, which is really what innovation is all about. Innovation is really all about making connections. And you learn how to make those connections and where to look for those connections. And the innovation just starts to happen. And just like anything else, the more you do something, the better you get. So give us a concrete so, example, because I can imagine for our listeners that that seems still very challenging. So in the TV context, what did you do? What's the innovation and the connection or the tools or the, I understand the mindset is different, but right. then concretely, how do you shift? Sure. I'll give you an example. One of the things that we used to do, this is back in the days when there were actual physical newspapers, paper newspapers. But you don't need actual physical newspapers to make this work. But what we would do is we would read 
two different news stories that were current, completely different. Maybe one's a sports story and one's a political story. And we'd force ourselves to think, okay, how are these two connected? We wouldn't say, are these two connected? Because here's the thing, and you know this as well as I do, your brain will try to answer any question you put to it. So that's why it's important to say, how are these two connected? Because if you just ask your brain, are these two connected? Your brain can say, nope, time for lunch. But if you say, how are these two connected? You force yourself to find connections. And a lot of times in those connections, you'll come up with a joke or a sketch idea. Something that connects these two things that nobody else sees. Because that's really what a joke is. That's what a punchline is. A punchline of a joke is making a connection. And when the audience hears that connection, they go, oh, that's good. Yes, I get the connection. You know, right. they didn't see it at first, but then you come up with a punchline and that delivers it to them. So that's just one technique, looking at two completely different things and forcing yourself asking, how are these two things connected? An open-ended question. So your brain is starts freewheeling to get the answer. Exactly. And you don't have to be the producer of a comedy show or a comedy writer to use this technique. Anybody in business can do this. They can just look at any success they see, any place, online, some success story of something. Ask yourself this question. How is this connected to what I do? Or how can I apply this to what I do or what I'm currently working on or my current challenge or my current opportunity? You start asking questions like that. You start trying to connect those dots. And that's when you're going to start finding out that you really are an innovation machine. When you start looking for those successes, especially those successes that are completely outside of your world, completely outside of your industry. Let's say you make heavy machinery and you read somewhere in the Wall Street Journal or someplace, you know, the London Times, whatever, about a mom and pop bakery that's doing something innovative and cool. Okay, it's very easy to read that and go like, well, that's got that's good for them, but that's got nothing to do with me. I make, you know, heavy machinery. But what if instead of just tossing it off, you go, oh, that's cool. How can I apply that? How can I take that idea and apply it to my world? Now, you may not come up with anything, but at least you're asking the question and you may come up with something. So yeah. once you get into the habit of looking for those connections, because again, that's all innovation really is. All creativity really is is finding those connections and then acting on them. That's really what it comes down to. And so much of it comes down to asking different questions. So the different questions, what you mean by different questions? Of course, open-ended questions starts with how, what, where, when, how much. Yeah. So when you say different questions, what are you referring to? Well, Besides the connection between two industries that seem to have nothing to do with each other. And yeah, ask, exactly. And forcing yourself to find the connection. Well, I think a lot of us keep asking the same questions. We ask things like, how can I sell more? How can I make more profit? You know, those kind of questions. How can I sell more widgets? Or we look at our competition and go, oh, what are they doing? How can I copy that? How can I duplicate that? And there's nothing wrong with those questions, except they lead to the same old, same old answers. So what if instead you ask questions that force you to think about your situation differently? One of the questions that I love to, when I'm working with clients, is I say, okay, it's one year from now or five years from now, whatever the timeline is, let's say five years. It's five years from now and you are now the envy of the industry. Everybody's looking at you thinking, wow, that is so cool. Look at what they're doing. Okay, what did you do to get there? So now instead of saying, oh, how can we become more successful? How can we sell more widgets? They're looking at it from a different perspective, from a perspective of, of having already arrived. And then they're just reverse engineering how they got there. Or asking questions like, okay, we've got a situation here, a problem. How would we solve this problem if we only had $100,000? How would we solve it if we only had $10,000? How would we solve it if we had a billion dollars and money was no object? Asking questions like, okay, we've just been through a pandemic and to some extent we're still on the tail end of that. We don't know what's going to happen. Okay, what are the new problems that my biggest clients are facing now that they weren't facing before and how can we help solve those problems? 
So that's the kind, it's those kinds of questions that get you thinking about what you do a little bit differently. Instead of looking at the competition and saying, oh, what are they doing? Let's copy that. Now you're looking at it from a completely different direction. And you can get some really nice, juicy conversations going with your team when you ask a question like that and say, let's just think about this for a while. You know, what are the new problems that our biggest customers are facing that they weren't facing before? Well, that's one big question in and of itself. And again, we're not saying, are they facing? We're saying, what new ones are they facing? We're forcing, it's that open and the question. We're forcing our brains to come up with the answers and then say, okay, so what's the connection between those new problems and what we do? How can we be the solution to those problems? It's just a different way of looking at, at your situation, at your challenges, at your opportunities, different from the way that your competition is probably looking at it because your competition is asking the same old, same old questions and getting the same old, same old answers. You ask new questions, you'll get new answers. You'll open up new possibilities and new contexts for solutions. Yes, and of course, that's very interesting for coaches because their career is based a lot on questioning. It is, I almost wonder, exclusively on questioning. Right, the Socratic approach. Exactly. Um, I want to ask you, you said uh, you manage a creative team differently. What do you mean yes. by that? What I learned about creative teams is that they love solving a problem. They love solving a challenge. And too often I see managers, leaders, try and solve the problem for the team. In other words, they say, here's what we need to do and here's how I want us to do it. Well, that takes all the joy out. What I found when you're leading a creative team is that, look, and by the way, every leader is leading a creative team. Whether you believe it or not, every leader, because every one of us is creative once we know what creativity really is. Every one of us is creative. So every leader has got this amazing resource, whether they know it or not. Most leaders are not tapping into it because they just, well, we're not creative people. Well, yes, you are if you allow your team to be creative, if you actually start to look for that and start to show that that is value. So here's the trick when leading a creative team. You as the leader, it is your job to come up with a vision or come up with how you're, if you're part of a larger organization, come up with the way that your particular team, your particular branch, your particular group within that team, how that vision matches the overall organization's vision. But it's your job to come up with, here's where we want to go. So here's the trick that I found when it comes to leading a creative, innovative team. You give them the what, because you're the leader. The what is the vision. Here's where we want to go. Give them the what. Let them surprise you with the how. Let them surprise you with the how. Okay, here's where we want to go. How can we get there? Don't dictate how to get there. Let them surprise you because they will come up with surprising answers, answers that you might not have come up with. And they may, in fact, be better than yours. Just because you have the title of leader or manager or boss or whatever doesn't mean that your ideas are necessarily the best. They may or may not be. But the best ideas can come from anybody. So... If you do that, you give them the what, the where, here's where we're going. Let them surprise you with the how. That does two things. First of all, it excites them because, again, a creative person, what they love more than anything is solving a challenge. So you've given them a challenge. But you've done more than that. As the leader, you've now given them ownership in the outcome. Right. You give them ownership and the other leader's role is really to set the direction. And kind of monitor where it's going. If it's getting too far off course, tap it back a little bit one way or another, but otherwise kind of stay out of it. I mean, let them play, really. And play is a I good know. word because it's creative, it's fun. They enjoy the work better. Yeah. And I know that this is an oversimplification of leadership, but I'll tell you, during 15 years of leading an incredibly creative, innovative team, it works. Yeah, and you have the experience of having that creative team. So I should have asked you this earlier, but give us a definition that's different between creativity and innovation. I did teach at university creativity, so I think it's important that we distinguish the two for our listeners. Exactly. And as you know, Katrina, they are different things. Creativity is a part of innovation, but innovation comprises much more than just creativity. Creativity is basically the ideation, coming up with the ideas. 
which is the first step or one of the first steps of innovation. Actually, the first step is defining the problem. But then coming up with ideas, that's what the creativity part is. And that's where a lot of people get stuck because they just, they don't know how to do it. That's where they think, well, that's, you know, I'm not Steve Jobs or Elon Musk, you know, pre-wackadoodle Elon Musk. You know, I'm not one of those creative geniuses. I'm not the woman who invented Spanx. I'm not that. Well, yes, you are. So let's get past that. So creativity is just coming up with the ideas, lots of ideas. But then there are two more steps after the idea part. The second part, once you have all those ideas, once you've done the ideation, now it's time for the evaluation. You've got to take all those ideas and figure out, okay, which one or ones, but you know, hopefully a very small number, which ones are we going to act on? Because you can't act on all of them. You can't invest in all of them, both monetarily, manpower, hours, you know, whatever. So there's the evaluation. Okay, which one is going to meet our criteria? And then there's the implementation. I call it, because I come from the world of television and showbiz, I call it lights, camera, action. Lights is where you come up with the ideas, because we think of light bulbs and ideas. Camera is the camera focuses. That's what a camera does. So that's the evaluation part. You focus on which of those ideas you're going to actually bring to the marketplace, bring to fruition, turn into something. And then we, so we've got lights, camera, and then action is the implementation. How can we actually make this into something? Because that's the big difference between creativity and innovation. Innovation is basically applied creativity. A lot of times I say that innovation is all about turning creativity into money. And by money, I just mean a tangible, valuable thing. It might be a blog article. It might be a new product. It might be a new service. But something that's tangible, it might be a way to shave 10 minutes off the weekly meeting. Okay, that's got value. So innovation is basically taking creativity and turning it into something of value. And there are steps to do that. Coming up with the ideas, that's light. Evaluating them, that's camera. And then implementing them. That's the action part. So some people might still be struggling with the idea that they're creative and can be innovative. So what can you do or say or get tips that you can share to help them be feel more innovative? Here's something that they can do. Yeah, it's a good little experiment. Sometime this week, those of you listening, give yourself a few days, but sometime within the next week, I want you to either go online or go to the newsstand or something, read an article that's got nothing whatsoever to do with how you make a living or with what's going on in your life. Just read an article that you wouldn't normally read, okay? It can be a blog post, it can be an article, it can be, you know, whatever. And then ask yourself the question that we talked about earlier, how can I apply this to what I'm working on right now, either personally or professionally, because these techniques work Personally, maybe you're having a problem with your significant other. Maybe you're having a problem with your kids, whatever. But, you know, read that and say, how can I apply this? And force yourself, sit down with like a pen and paper, force yourself to come up with at least three ideas, at least three ways that whatever you read can apply to your situation. And they might all three be terrible or they might be so outlandish as to be laughable. That's okay at this point. That's completely okay. All you're doing is teaching your brain to make connections because your brain will do it naturally if you let it. But we've kind of forgotten that skill because we don't have to use it very much. Now, if you're producing a comedy TV show for 15 years, you have to use it because that's what it's all about. But most of us don't have to flex that muscle. And so it's kind of gotten lazy. So it's a really cool way to start building that muscle. And then don't just do it once, you know, do it every week, do it every couple of days, start getting into the habit of asking, how can I apply this to my situation? And you're going to find out that you are creative. You'll start coming up with creative things because your brain will start to get the idea. Oh, we're doing this now. Oh, we're doing connections. Okay. And it'll get into that groove. And those of you who have studied neuroscience and neuroplasticity, it literally is a groove. You start to those connections within the brain, those neurons and things, they actually do form stronger connections. Your brain gets into a habit of creativity and innovation. So I'm going to ask you the contrarian question. What is innovation not? Innovation is not magic. 
innovation is not reserved for the gifted few. Innovation, as we talked about, innovation is not just coming up with ideas. That's the creativity part. Innovation is not as hard as people make it out to be. Some people think that innovation is literally rocket science. Like if you're not inventing the iPhone or the rocket ship to Mars or the internet, you're not really an innovator. That's not true. Innovation is just creating something of value. Again, if you come up with a way to shave 10 minutes off the Monday morning meeting, that's an innovation. That's creating value. If you come up with the curved shower rod, okay, that's already been come up. You know, Somebody else came up with that, but that's an innovation. Is it life-changing? Well, I spent a lot of time in hotels. It's kind of nice having that curved shower rod so the shower curtain doesn't you know, come and stick to your, you know, become all clammy and stick to your body. Um, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so, you know, innovation does not have to be huge and earth shattering to count. There are just like, because innovation is all about solving problems. And just as problems come in all sizes and shapes, so do innovations come in all sizes and shapes. So don't discount your innovation just because you think, well, yeah, but that's just a little thing. So what? Is it a value to anybody? And I don't mean necessarily that they'll pay money for it, although they might, but does it make money, save money, save time? If it does any of those three things, it's creating value, no matter how big or small it is. So don't be hung up on the fact that, well, I didn't invent the Tesla, I didn't invent the iPhone, so I'm not an innovator. Yeah, yeah, you are. Get over it. Great. I think that's a great message, Bill. Thank you so very much. We're coming to the end of our podcast. So tell me, where can people get a hold of you? The best place is my website. No surprise there. It's BillStainton.com. That's S-T-A-I-N-T-O-N. BillStainton.com. Just go there. You'll be able to contact me from there. Thank you very much. And I've seen you speak and you do an incredible job. So thank you oh, also. Oh, thanks so much. That's very nice of you. For sharing your knowledge and your experience. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Excellent Executive Coaching Podcast. You can subscribe to all future podcasts at excellentexecutivecoaching.com. Join us each Wednesday to learn more about the latest trends in leadership techniques and bring your coaching to the next level. To learn more about Dr. Burris's CEO Mastermind, use the contact form at excellentexecutivecoaching.com.